um, student group, the National Varsity Chinese Group, a big round of applause for our We have today actually chosen a very, very crucial core topic for us to discuss tonight. And tonight, my role here is just to play referee. Uh, if you watch the movie Ola Bola, the referee really got nothing much to do except to control the, the two very brilliant uh, speakers that we have today. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, debater YB Singh. Zizi, I think he is very, a very familiar face in Penang. He is the MP for Bayanbaru. Uh, in, uh, in the island of Penang. He is also the strategic director of Parti Keadilan Rakyat. He is a former state assemblyman for Pantai Jarajab, which is part of the Bayamara constituency, a former political secretary of PKR de facto leader Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim, and a co-founder of Malaysian Student Youth and Democratic Movement, DEMA. So I'd like to welcome YB Singh to the stage. I think you're on the side. Instead of appointing the new Deputy Prime Minister and Deputy President, he called for an election. And in 1981, we had the first election between Tunku Razali Hamza and uh, Musa Kitan. In that election, for the first time, we saw money being used in the party election. In 1984, the same thing happened again. And subsequently, Mahate was asked by Musa to get rid of uh, Razali because of his monetization of politics. Mahate did not do it. In fact, Mahathe made Razali trade minister. And subsequently, that led to the big problem between Mahathe and Musa. And Musa eventually was moved out of the political scene by Mahathe. The next big defining moment was 1987, when Musa and Razali combined forces with Mahathe. This was another defining moment. By this time, Mahathe had appointed Daim Zainuddin as his finance minister. And Daim had come in and not only monetized the political system, he had also become a key player in the Malaysian economy. So here we see now money politics moving into mainstream economy. We now see money politics being acted out in the corporate sector, with the party and Darren personally and other cronies of the state suddenly emerging and capturing control of the corporate sector. So here we are seeing the escalation of this problem, leading to a crisis specifically even within UMNO. The big debate in 1987 was between Team A and Team B, Mahate versus Razali. It was all about Mahathe creating a kitchen cabinet, having these cronies around him, and they were capturing most of the corporate wealth. The Team A, Team B uh, election was divisive, divisive in the sense that it really fractured the party into. 
And subsequently, we saw how Mahate ousted Razali from the party. Razali moves into the opposition. The next big moment is 1993. And here, I'm happy to have uh, YB Singh here, because YB Singh is from PKR, and his president, de facto president, is Anwar Ibrahim. In 1983, when Anwar Ibrahim decided to run for the party deputy presidency post, he did something very important. He took, for the first time, money politics down to the grassroots. Mahathir had changed the rules when he formed New Amda. Now, to win the elections, you had to have massive grassroots support. Here we are seeing now the movement of money from the top right down to the grassroots. Mahathi himself called it a cancer that had permeated the body part. Anwar won that election. It was a deeply monetized election. In that election, he got substantial volume of money from the corporate sector. Some of the key big players in the economy stood behind Anwar in that election. That election, they estimated about US 300 million was spent, according to some research. 300 million US dollars was spent. According to one report, that was more than what Bill Clinton had spent, or rather the American presidential candidates had spent in the 1992 elections. Such was the volume of money that had been used. In that election, I still remember that year, Anwar proudly announcing as finance minister, the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange has seen more trade activity, trading activity today than even the New York Stock Exchange. What a great phenomenon for Malaysia. That is important because it shows you where the money was coming from. How the money had now moved even into the corporate sector, how they were using the stock exchange to raise money, and how this had entered in large, a large way into the body politic. This was truly, as Mahathi said, a defining moment. The next important point in Malaysian history was 2003 when Abdullah took over. Abdullah promised to change uh, money politics. He promised to eradicate corruption, but he had one problem. The party was not behind him. The party didn't support any of his endeavors to try and eradicate corruption. And in fact, as you can see, a new host of cronies emerged in 2003. One of them included his son in law, Kairi Tamaludin, the ECM liberal scandal, if you remember how he became an overnight millionaire. The big issue was really 2008. 2008 was a defining moment, like 1987, in terms of how he changed politics in a big way. The rise suddenly of the opposition, as Cynthia said, five states now under the control of the opposition. We had not seen this before. After 2008, Barisan National realized they had a big fight on their hands in the next election. Money had to be accumulated in big numbers, in big volumes for the next election. 2013 was a very important election. In that election, we saw Penang, it was very clear, the voluminous amount of money that was spent in Penang in this election. There were allegations that Joe Lowe, for example, now the new crony of then Prime, of the Prime Minister of the time, Prime Minister of Najib Razak, bringing in a lot of money during the election. The New York Times carried a huge story on this issue. It was a deeply monetized election. Now, the problem was very serious. It was very serious because allegations now were also being made that the opposition had also used money during that election. I personally went to all the states in Malaysia during the election and I can say that there was, there's an element of truth to that. On both sides you can see money being used. The big question for us in 2013 was this, where is all this money coming from? And then we had 1MDB. In 2015, Najib himself acknowledged that the money had come from the political system in a slush fund that he had created for himself. So where does that leave us? Today, in today's, can you change please? In today's uh, debate, I want to show you the difference between Mahate and Najib Razak. The two key players still in Malaysian politics, after all you saw yesterday what is happening. The big debate today is between Mahate and Najib. How similar or different are they? If you look at Mahate and the way he did things, his was a politics of patronage. His was a politics of developing Malay capitalists or Malaysian capitalists, promoting the BCIC, the Movement for Transversal Industrial Community. The whole idea was about the politics of patronage. Read my books on Malaysian, Malaysia's political economy. It's all there. If you compare this with Najib, 
It was not about patronage. It was about plutocracy, corruption, grand scale. Cynthia mentioned it again. It's been so. It's been uh, acknowledged now that we are dealing with a kleptocratic state. We are dealing with high levels of corruption. So this is a fundamental difference between Mahathir and Andrew. That shows you how bad the situation has become. In terms of policy agenda, Mahathir had a developmental idea. As I said, create Malaysian capitalists. So if you look at people like Ananda Krishnan and Francis Yeo, while we may be critical of them, the fact is Ananda Krishnan created Astro and Maxis from nothing. Francis Yeo has created a thriving company because of the rents that he secured. The rents had been productively used to create companies. Of course, there were also a lot of rents that were wasted. Barry Wayne has recorded that very well. But I'm just showing you the difference between Mahade and Najib. In Najib's case, if you look at the way in which it has been played out, it is extremely speculative. Of course, his main man is Joe Lo. And look at how Joe Lo works. Let's go to the next one to show you how it works. In the case of Mahathir, Mahathir was totally enamored with the stock market. The stock market was the avenue through which he developed conglomerates. The stock market for Anwar, as I mentioned, became an avenue through which you can raise money. In the case of Najib, it's very covert. We could trace how Mahathir raised the money. Books have been written, but I have written books on this. I could follow the money. Mahathir was an open book in many ways. I cannot follow the money with Najib. Every day you open the newspapers, the international press newspapers, of course, and they're telling us there's more and more covert money flowing into his account. Such is the scale of corruption now in the country. In, the term, in terms of the use of domestic, in terms of using markets, Mahathir focused on the domestic market, raised funds from the domestic market. In the case of Najib, a voluminous amount of money is coming from abroad. This is not good. We have no clue where the money is coming from. And the money is now being apparently coming from Saudi Arabia, who apparently have a great interest in our national politics. That means they also have an interest in our national politics. This is not good for the country. Money in UMNO. Yes, UMNO had slush funds. UMNO had these slush funds from the time of Tunku Abdul Rahman. UMNO wanted to be independent of the MCA and Chinese thumb cases, he put it. And that slush fund, by Mahathir's own admission, he handed over a uh, huge volume of money in Amno's accounts to Abdullah when he stood down. In the case of, in the case of Najib, even his party members didn't know about his account. Even his deputy prime minister and deputy president did not know of this account. And this money went into his own personal account only after it was exposed did he acknowledge that the money was there, but he also went on to say that the money was used for, for electoral purposes. And if you look in terms of how companies, let's move on to the economy, how companies have evolved. Mahathir had clear visions of creating conglomerates, first very diversified, but later he began to discipline them until the 1997 crisis when he had a big problem. In the case of uh, Najib, the businesses are mixed, meandering all over the place. The emphasis is on GLICs and GLCs. Mahathir was never interested in GLCs and GLICs. He was interested in private capital. Now, the problem here is, when you look at this, Carefully, the Prime Minister is also the Finance Minister. And when the Finance Minister controls the GLICs, that means the government-linked investment companies like LUTH, LTAT, PNB, Ministry of Finance Incorporated, Kazana, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. When he has control over such enormous companies, the implications of this on the economy is extremely serious because we have already seen how he's been using the GLCs and the GLICs to help deal with the one and the crisis. I'm running out of time, so let me move on quickly. Huh? But you have here the basic difference between Mahathir and Najib. I want to move on to the next slide where why are reforms needed now? The monetization of politics today is very serious. It has permeated into mainstream politics. This was no longer just a mere unknown matter. It has permeated into the opposition, and what has moved out into the opposition, and I'll make this argument, you can see money politics of a similar sort also in PKR. Look at the recent PKR elections. There were allegations, serious allegations of money politics there too. So money politics is no longer a BN matter, it is now an opposition matter, but now it has become worse. It is also a general election matter. Our electoral system is being corrupted because we have not monitored the financing of politics. In terms of Access, it is not equal. 
I can tell you now that when we try to mount a campaign in 2009-2010 with Transparency International to bring about the reforming of politics, when I went to Parliament to debate this, the opposition said no to us. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Opposition members telling me no, they don't want our reforms. And when I asked why, they said this is the first time we are getting money from business. So why should we say no now? And we say no now, we can't fight the next election. And when I said let's draw a line and take it from here, level up the playing field, as much as you're getting money now, you will not get as much money as Barisan. The argument didn't fly back with that. And then you saw the consequences of this in 2013. The scale of money politics in the general election was phenomenal. So I am concerned here too with the opposition and their lack of regard for the need for the reforms on this matter. In terms of why this is important, because I look at how covert the funding is. I personally don't know where the money is coming from for even the opposition. And I'll put it to Mr. Sim. Please tell us where is PKR getting their money from? Are you going to open up your accounts and tell us exactly who gave you all this money? I can bet you he will say, we can't do that. Please prove me wrong. We can't do that because we do that, the government will come after other donors. And then they won't give us any more money. They will persecute the donors. Okay, let's debate that point. The idea of legislation, it is true. The legislation is inadequate. We have to change it. Both parties are doing it now. They are abusing the legislation because it's so inadequate for their own vested interests. In terms of institutions, the institutions have no autonomy. There's no point if we come and introduce legislation without making institutional reforms. Interestingly enough, of all people, Mahathir said yesterday, we must have institutional reforms. The AG is too strong. The MACC is too weak. The Prime Minister is extremely powerful. Of course, Mahathir was responsible for that. But even Mahathir now has openly admitted that this is a big issue. And finally, the issue of money-based factionalism. Look, I put it to you and to my co-debater. We are all the solution with our political parties. We don't care whether they are the opposition or from the Pakistan national. Factionalism on both sides is very dire. And much of this factionalism is not due to ideological differences or policy differences. It is due to money. Factions based on money is ruining our political parties. So why then is there this hesitancy to change the reforms? So today we come to you and we say to you, we have reforms, we have proposals, there's a table out there, the reforms are ready. Here, can you please change? Here I'm showing you the reforms, the three major reforms. Legislation has to be reformed, internal party politics has to be reformed, Institutions, let me go through this very quickly. The Elections Act. The Elections Act has to be changed because although the Election Act does monitor the financing of uh, elections, there's one loophole there. It's a major loophole. The loophole is this. Any candidate running for the state as, a, as a state assemblyman or as a parliamentarian must declare his accounts after the election. There's very close monitoring as to how much money a candidate can spend. And if you look at the accounts of all the candidates after the election, they have spent exactly the amount allowed allotted under law. If, the, if it's 100,000 for state assembly, they spend 999,000. But the fact of the matter is this. There's no law controlling the parties and what parties can spend during the election. And as you saw in the last election, the volume of money spent by the parties, where they don't have to account to anybody this is why so much money has flowed into the system. So now, we need to have legislative reforms. The full proposals are there as to what the legislative reforms are. The second reform that we have to change is the Society Act. We need a new political party set. Because the, the political parties are being controlled by the Registrar of Societies. You cannot put political parties and Registrar of Societies in, under the Registrar of Societies. They're completely different. But more importantly, the Registrar of Societies reports to the Minister of Home Affairs. So a member of the executive controls all parties in the country. How can we have such a system? So this system really needs to be changed in terms of having a new legislation which has oversight of all over all political parties. The second one, institutions. 
Institutions, as I said, have to be changed. Let's just focus on two. The first one is the Election Commission. The second one is the Red Straw, Com uh, Red Straw Societies. I've spoken about the Red Straw Societies. But for the Election Commission, we still question the independence of the EC. The EC has been questioned in terms of, because although the King appoints the members, the recommendations still come from the Prime Minister. It cannot be done that way. The Prime Minister cannot have any say in the appointments of the Electoral Commissions. And the third issue, this is probably the most interesting issue. The first two which I've mentioned is acceptable. I think most people say yes, that's fine. But I'm saying here now to you, we also need to introduce reforms where we will monitor what is happening in all our political parties. This is unprecedented. Some people will say it is even stupid. How can you do that? It's a violation of their rights. I'm saying we don't have a choice. I'm putting it to you that we have to monitor internal party elections too because that's where the real money politics is. Today, if you look at UMNO and if you look at the leaders who are coming up in UMNO, where are all the young leaders? Even the leaders, even the young people, when I spoke to the young people during the elections in Namno, they said, we can't make inroads because the party is controlled by the warlords. The warlords control the party coffers. We can't break through. And that's true. Who are our young party leaders? Kairi Jamaluddin, son of the ex prime son in law of the ex prime minister, until recently, Mukris, son of an ex prime minister. So if you look at all the young people who are leaders or potential leaders, they're all uh, relatives of former leaders in the party. But what of the opposition too? As I said earlier, in the opposition too, we are seeing money politics now in some parties. And if they too have now gone down that road, we really need to get this together. So legislations have to be put in place to ensure that when elections are held in the parties too, there is an opportunity for young, bright people to come up. The elections have to be based on people based on merit. It has to be based on policy ideas, how to take the country forward. Listen to the debates today in Parliament too. What kind of debates are we hearing from our politicians? Is this the kind of debates that we expect from our elected representatives? But that's what we are getting because of the system of rent-seeking, patronage, and now deep monetization of politics, which has contributed to factionalism, which has destroyed even the political parties that claim to represent our interests. So we need to introduce reforms on this matter too. So let me end here by putting this to YB Sin. My question to him is this. Will you support these reforms? And even if he says yes, I'd like to go further. Will your party support these reforms? Let me go even further. Will Anwar Ibrahim support these reforms? Thank you. Yes, uh, I did warn all of you of the brilliance that was going to come out. Now we are going to uh, allow Wendy Singh to have his 20 minutes to counter.